The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com, IgnitionAPG.com, PlayUSA at PLAEUSA.com, and Soranex Exercise Equipment at Soranex.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeever. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeever's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeever. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 167. Have a great episode for you today. Nick Grantham, uh, a strength coach that's based over in Newcastle, England, uh, has come on the show. He's a, a Nike consultant, uh, performance consultant for them. He's, he's done, uh, you name it, he's done it over there, training a variety of different sports, uh, working both in the private and, and uh, professional and amateur uh, arenas. And uh, he's written a couple books that I've really enjoyed. He wrote a book called You're Hired uh, a while back about, you know, get, kind of getting into the strength and conditioning field. He wrote a book, uh, the, strength, the Strength and Conditioning Bible, and uh, has really done a great job. I've just enjoyed watching him from afar and, and uh, seeing the things that he's doing. And, and so I wanted to have him on the show. We're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the book writing process. We're going to dive into some of the principles in both those books. Uh, you're hired in the strength and conditioning Bible, and uh, and just talk about you know some shop in terms of uh, building out a personal brand and um, and and finding your niche within this this crowded space. And so, know you're going to get a ton out of this episode. Before we do, we want to make sure we recognize our sponsor this week, Edition APG. Uh, they're finishing up, if not already, uh, their vet training right now. They, they've had I think I talked to Cliff the other day, you know, 30 plus. Uh, athletes training up in Cincinnati that are from various different teams. And um, as you've heard me talk about them throughout the, 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 the time on the show, uh, they do it in the right way, mind, body, spirit. Uh, not, you know, these, it's phenomenal to see these guys, and they'll make some posts about training and different ways that they're training. But the things they're doing within the community and the, and the, and the culture they've fostered uh, to you know, get these guys to give back while they're in town, um, it's been phenomenal, and and, uh, and so it's a, it's a great group of people doing some big things and doing being innovative in the process and really pushing the envelope. They got their strength system now. They got their speed system. Um, definitely check those things out. But uh, can't say enough great things about Ignition and uh, and the way they're going about their business right now. So sit back, enjoy this episode, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. Excited to have Nick Grantham with us. He's a performance consultant for Nike based over in, in England and, and uh, doing great things. He's written a couple books, and um, I followed him from afar and, and wanted to have him on the show, man. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing with everybody, buddy. Well, Ron, thank you for inviting me and reaching out to me from across the Atlantic. Yeah, we're having a little bit of trouble with Skype, and, and so we're not going to be able to do the video. Uh, he claims it's because of the way he looks. I claim it's because of the way I look, but... <laughs> Um, but we're going to get it done anyway. So, man, hey, Nick, take us back, you know, Taekwondo days, kind of what got you into strength and conditioning, and then what's led you through, you know, English Institute of Sport to, to being out on your own with Nike there? Sure. So um, I, I took a fairly unconventional route into strength and conditioning, um, and having read your book, I think there's a lot of parallels between our, our paths. So I left school at 16, Went to the financial services profession, so I worked in a bank for two years and an insurance company for four years. Um, university wasn't something that my family did. You know, no one had ever been to uni from my family. My brother was in the military. My other brother had an apprenticeship. Um, and then I was at the same time as working in insurance in Taekwondo and, and doing quite well. And met Alan Cosgrove, who, who used to be a competitor as well as a, a teammate. Um, and he was at university studying sports and you know I've always come from a very sporty background and, and that just kind of appealed to me the idea so I went back to night school um, never the you studied night school to get some additional qualifications and then went to university uh, got a sports science undergrad and a, a postgrad in 
uh, exercise and nutrition science. So that that was the patient side of things. Um, and at that time, back in the late 90s, strength and conditioning as a profession didn't really exist in the UK. So I started off as a sports scientist. And I was really lucky, I think, of where the profession was at that point that I walked straight into a job working with the Great Britain gymnastics team, which on reflection is kind of crazy. That would probably be my end game where I wanted to be. And I was straight straight in out of university. But sports science was very young those days. And I think I was very fortunate about that. So I found myself preparing gymnasts for the uh, Sydney Olympics with having just graduated from university. Um, I then moved from there to England netball, um, and that was as a strength and conditioning coach. And I remember at the time, my boss told me I was committing career suicide because strength and conditioning, what was that? Everyone was a sports scientist. You're not going to make any money. Um, And, you know, I, I, again, speaking to people like Alan and looking to was the States as, as the influence on the UK, we had a hunch that strength and conditioning was going to blow up over here in the UK. So I, I jumped, as you say, with both feet in, took a risk, right. and became one of the first strength and conditioning coaches in a paid role in the UK. Um, learned a lot on the job as I was going, and then, again, rather fortuitously, the English Institute of Sport came into being, pretty much after we, we showed so poorly in, in the Olympics they, the government decided that something needed to be done. So they created this uh, organization, which basically serviced all of the elite athletes to prepare them for major championships. And, you know, that's then when my career just, just took off because all of a sudden I was running a team of um, strength coaches looking after up to 200 athletes that were all competing in, in major championships. So I was very lucky to be exposed to a wide range of sports from Paralympic athletes to team sports, individual sports. It, it was phenomenal. Right. Um, and then uh, never wanted to sit still uh, and, and primarily due to family commitments, you know, the life of working in sport is, as, as, you, as you know, is, is full on. We lived in the middle of the country. Both parents were either ends. So the decision was made that uh, with a young family on the way, I'd move to Newcastle where my wife's family are from so that at least if I was away on training camps and working she had a support network to to bring up the kids with so I moved to Newcastle and went out on my own another big gamble a lot of people at the time said again career suicide um, but the, the one thing about taking those gambles is you've got to make it work um, and, and I've not looked back I've really enjoyed working for myself that's great that's great well, there's lots of things to pull out there, and, and, and I want to dig into those as we go. But, yeah. you know, you obviously uh, have gone through, and, 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 and each step of the way, you know, I, I talk about this in my book, like, like you, you had mentioned, that you're not always quite ready for the job that you get. You know, you weren't mm-hmm. quite ready to, to lead gymnastics um, at, at that, at, right out of college. And then, you know, at, at each one of those jobs um, along the way, whether or not jumping out on your own or or, or uh, jumping into a new sport or different different aspect or discipline of the of the profession, uh, all became you know presented its own challenges and and opportunities to make mistakes. What was one of the biggest mistakes that you've made as a coach, and kind of how you learned from it? Oh wow, <laughs> I've made a few. Um, I think it, it's probably not a specific mistake, but I know for a, a number of years I probably was trying to be somebody or something I wasn't. So um, I think that there's a lot of coaches that, well, there's a lot of super smart people out there. And and it seemed that everyone that I was mixing with knew real long fancy words, could tie me up in knots in terms of underpinning scientific. They could just repeat this stuff. And I've I've never had a great memory for all all of that. And the way I learn is very visual and, and, sort of attaching it to stories and, and stuff like that. So for a long time when I gave presentations or when I coached, I, I guess I was trying to be a bit too bit too clever and a bit too technical um, and, and trying to please other people. And always in, in my gut, I was probably thinking, well, this doesn't really make sense. Why, why is this theory being proposed or why am I trying to present in a certain way? And it's, 
probably not until more recent years, maybe the last five or six years, that I've been very comfortable saying, look, you know, this is how, this is who I am. This is how I coach. This is how I speak. Uh, this is the, the way that I deliver information. Um, and, I, and I've got more confidence now to sort of question some of the systems and theories that come out um, rather than just taking them on face value. Mm. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously that's a, I think that's something that everybody tries to do. They try to, you know, they try to, um, you know, talk a certain way or try to be bigger than they are without fully understanding concepts and, and why they're doing what they're doing. And, you know, ultimately it's the coaches. It's it, As you go in this profession, you know, it's, it's not um, – trying to prove how much you know it's really you know learning to, to ask the right questions um as you mature in this profession and really get to the root of why you're doing what you're doing and those that have the the best understanding of that are the ones that are the most successful i think you i think you would agree with me yeah absolutely i think one of the things i learned when i when i developed the support team at the english institute of sport was i surrounded myself with people that are way smarter than me um and when i recruited rather than um, seeing it as a sign of weakness or, or being threatened by having a strength coach that was had way better book smarts or a biomechanist that knew far more about uh, that subject. I saw it as a position of strength because the worst thing I could have done was recruit five versions of me because sure. we, we, we'd, we'd just be stuck. Whereas by having the confidence in knowing where my weak areas are, then I can recruit the right people to add to it, and then you know the sum becomes greater than the, the uh, than its parts. Absolutely, absolutely. You know when you when you decided to step away, obviously because of family. It's it, you know there's um, there's an entrepreneur out there that has a podcast that that always talks about the baby effect. You know and how you know when you when you start when you have a young family or or get married or, or whatever. You know, all of a sudden, as a strength coach, that young strength coach that just, you know, that's that technician that just loves what they do, values and priorities and, and things along those shine shift a little bit. Yeah. When you made that jump into that kind of entrepreneurial space, and I talk about that as well in my book, you know, what, you know, that was obviously a scary time, but what, where, where has been the things that have been surprisingly uh, beneficial to you by making that jump? I think, so... It's it's incredibly volatile for yourself, often, particularly when when sport, professional sport, is, is your income because you you know very well you're hired and fired very quickly. Not right. always because you've done a bad job. Um. So, but that that volatility means that you that I I, I probably try and have multiple sources of work coming through. Um. But what it does allow is a lot of flexibility. I I, I find that when I was working in a government-funded position, yeah, the hours were, were structured, but sometimes that structure didn't allow you the flexibility. So if it's my daughter's sports day and I want to take two hours out in the afternoon, I, re I reschedule my day and I'll come into work either earlier or later um, and I'll take time out. Um, last week it was sunny in Newcastle for the first time in, in all year. So I jumped <laughs> on my mountain bike and went mountain biking for three hours. There you go. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that I didn't do any work for the rest of the day. I probably stayed up a little bit later and, and did some programming. But I, I find I, I've got flexibility that's probably some of my colleagues haven't got. And that, as a side effect, has probably afforded me opportunities with my family, but also opportunities with work. You know, I can think of, particularly working for Nike, the projects that they ask me to work on are always usually very short notice. And can you go somewhere next week um, colleagues that work for big organisations have to put in leave requests and, and you know I just have to speak to myself can I do that yeah you can let's reschedule and away you go yeah you know part of that you know like you talk about creating multiple streams of income and I think that's a, a valuable step whether or not you are in a government funded position or a university or or whatever, I think if if you have all your eggs in one basket, um, I think you're asking for trouble. Um, you know, as, as a yeah. strength coach, there's a, there's a lot of colleagues. So when again working at the English Institute of Sport was fantastic, but it, you know it was a government funded organisation, and probably in the early years it was quite a secure sport, but uh, place to work. But ultimately, 
funding is based on performance. And yeah. I think what a lot of my colleagues started to miss was, listen, if your team don't perform, that funding will be cut and you could be out of a job. So, you know, one of the things I learned very early on from reading some business books was always have a second job. Right. And that started off as just writing a blog. It would be writing for magazines, you know, but so that if if your world did end in a certain sport, at least you could pick up quite quickly some additional income. So I always ran circuit training classes for general population. There was always something that I'd be doing in addition to my day job. Um, and I think that would be a really good lesson for for anyone that's working in any sport. If you think it's secure, just always have a second string of income coming through. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, you know, they'll call that you know your side hustle. You know, and having a yeah. good side, having a good side hustle, um, you know, gives you a little bit more confidence and and takes a little bit less stress out of your life think, when you're when you're in a I high volatile uh, job. Yeah. So you know, it it teaches you some really valuable lessons. You know, of how to prioritize and how to um, you know run a business, even if it's just you're running a simple little bit of. Um, of a sideline that, you know, doing your tax, doing your accounts, right. um, all of your sort of business promotion stuff, even if it's on a very small scale, I think it, it that adds to your ability as a coach. It gives you some of those softer skills that, you know, everyone comes out with great X's and O's, but it's sometimes those softer skills that people haven't got that, that hold them back in the profession. No question. No, I agree. You, you, um, you know, part of those multiple streams of income for you is, has been the writing process. And you mentioned mm -hmm. writing for blogs and, and magazines and publications and things, but you've also put out a couple books and, uh, you know, you had one, you're hired where you're kind of talking about the, the, the hiring process of strength and conditioning, which I thought was fantastic. And then the, the strength and conditioning Bible, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about each one and kind of what was your motivation behind writing each. So the Your Hide, I remember, it was probably December, it was coming up to Christmas, and it was about 2010, I think, um, and I was answering probably the umpteenth email asking me, how do I get into the job, what books would I recommend, how can I get mentorships, and I was like, I just kept saying the same things over and over again, and I figured, you know what, there's obviously a, a need for this information, and rather than me sending the same email out, every day, why don't I just put it all into one place and, and get it get it out there. So that was the idea. I then sat on that idea for about a year and did nothing with it, <laughs> um, as, as most people do, and then um, eventually got round to, to writing the book, um, and du during the process of putting that together, um, I, I'd had a, a young aspiring S&C coach that uh, did an internship with me for three months. Sadly, he, he passed away. He had a, a brain tumor. Um, and I figured out, and he kind of epitomized everything that I talked about in the book about he would have been a phenomenal um, uh, strength and conditioning coach. So um, I decided to give all the proceeds to, to charity for the book. And the, the way we cut it is 75% goes to a cancer charity and 25% goes to a bursary in his name for uh, aspiring SSC coaches for, for CPD. And that's, that's partly through the UK Strength and Conditioning Association. Um, so it, it's great. I've got an idea of, of an update for it that I'm working on at the moment, which will be pretty cool. Um, but I just need to find an extra couple of hours in the day to, to do it. <laughs> I hear that. What about the Strength and Conditioning Bible? So the Strength and Conditioning Bible um, has probably almost killed me writing that. Uh, it's probably <laughs> been one of the most nerve-wracking things to do because it it's really, you, you know, that's that's my training my training principles that I've gleaned over the last sort of eighteen plus years. It's there for everyone to read and for everyone to take pot shots at. Sure. Um, that was sort of inspired. So when I moved to Newcastle, part of what I did was set up uh, a private um, training for, training venue for members of the general population. And again, I was really nervous that I'd only ever worked with elite athletes. Could I actually train the general person walking off the street? Would my principles work? And very quickly, I realised they did. You know, principles are going to work for everybody. It's just how you then progress and regress the the system and, and the exercises. And I just felt I, I came up with this idea that wow, everyone can train like an athlete. Everyone can train like an athlete. You know, it's not general population and athletes. The principles are the same. 
So I started doing talks on that subject, and again, Alan Cosgrove, who's been a big influence on me, always says if, you, if you've got a presentation, you've got a book. Um, and and he was right. So o- over time, I sort of added to it and fleshed it out and approached a, a publisher uh, with, a, with several ideas. They liked the idea of everyone could train like an athlete and commissioned me to, to write the book. And, and then it was a difficult process of actually sitting down and writing it, um, particularly because it's a sort of a technical book. Um, obviously, as you, as you go through it, it's probably sort of an 18-month to two-year process, and, you know, my ideas change. But once you've started writing a chapter, you kind of need to commit to it. Um, so towards the end, it was quite difficult because there's probably things in there that I would change, just tweak. Um, but at some point, you've got to press the button and... And put it out there. So um, yeah, it, it's been well received so far. Um, it seems it, I've been surprised at how many coaches have been using it because I I aimed it really at the end user. I aimed it at the recreational triathlete or recreational football player, someone that was into their fitness that just wanted a, a good program. Right. But I, but I guess because I've I do cover scientific principles in there in a, in a easy to understand manner. I think a lot of young personal trainers and, and strength coaches are picking it up and, and taking some gems from it as well. So that's that's been great. Yeah, I think there's 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 not enough of that out there in terms of coaches that have just used their experiences and the principles that they believe in and created their system and put it out there. And when you look across the board, the Joe Kins, the Cal Dietzes, the Jim Windlers. Uh, you know, everybody that's done that, it's been well received by coaching the coaching community. And so yeah. I, I'd highly encourage everybody that's listening that, that they, they do. If you have that presentation um, on your on your philosophy, your your program, that, that it is a book, you know, and it and it's it's not a, it's a it's a difficult process, but it's not as hard as people make it out to be. And that, that kinda leads me into my my next question for you is is I, I do, I believe that every coach has a book in them. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you've written multiples. I've written one. Um, you know, w- talk about a little bit about that process and kind of like if some if, if a coach was listening that wanted to write a book, mm-hmm. what would you tell them to do? Um, I I, I think uh, yeah, it, it's just trying to consolidate all of the information that you've got and, and my my both of those books have come out of presentations that I've given. Um, so that that for me, it works for me. It, it's a good starting point. I get my information out as a presentation, and you know, obviously, I talk through that, and, and that that's kind of the starting point. And then it's just fleshing out each of those elements. Um, I, I think people should, could be a lot more structured than I was. I, I definitely left everything to the last minute. Um, so I, I would definitely have a structure in terms of how you're going to write the book and the hours you're going to spend. It does it does take time. Um, and I think the the key is it's never going to be perfect. Right. So the strength and conditioning bible is I'm really proud of it, and I'll stand by everything that's in there. But it's just a natural process of being a coach. There's things in there that I would change. So it's never going to be perfect. So at some point, you've got to ship it. You've got to press the button, um, and hold your breath and wait and see how it's how it's received and and hopefully we might get another crack at it again and, and do a revised version with with new updates it's, it's interesting uh again people in the profession like mike ball coming for a lot of um flack from other coaches for changing his mind it's okay to change your mind that's exactly you know? right that's, that's exactly what we've got to do as coaches right it's i, I find it funny that people take shots at, at coaches that say well, actually do you know what I've done this for another two years, and actually, I wouldn't do that again. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with you. I think that uh, you know, I've mentioned that before on the show is how you know I, I was one of those guys that you know would would, would critique Mike for changing mm. his mind on things. And what I've come to find, and what I learned, and and I was ignorant and and wrong was um, that he just found a way to kind of monetize his learning experience. You know, mm. by he, he'd learn something and he would share it. You know, and and as a content creator, like you or myself, we know how much work goes into that. Mm. Um, and, uh, he was doing that probably out of, you know, mostly just like it is for us as, as 99%, you 
you know, goodness of your heart, just to try and find a way to give back to the community. Um, but then obviously found a way to monetize that. And as he grew as a coach, he, he put more information out there. And I think that's, a, yeah. I think that's important. I, I do. I think um, one, of, one of the biggest take on messages I've got from writing two books is I will never, ever give a, a coach a hard time if they've written a book because I know, I know that they'll have poured their heart and soul into it. So even if I read it and think, well, I don't agree with that or there's not much in it for me to take away, I won't criticize them because I know the hours they've spent. I've, I've walked in their shoes. That's right. and, I, and I would say that anyone that just picks up a book and goes, oh, well, that's rubbish, you know, try writing a book yourself. Then right. come back and comment. That's right. You know, I, I, you know, I, I get this question quite a bit, and, and just to throw my two cents in there, you know, everybody that's asked me, you know, what's the what what would I recommend process wise and things like that. Um, you know, I did it the wrong way, probably, and probably just like you, I, I, you know, I, I made it more difficult than it needed to be. Uh, but I would, what I tell people now is to start with just mind mapping, you know, throwing up, you know, pick a topic like you would if you were given a presentation, throw everything out there that you could possibly do um, on post-it notes or something along those lines. And then because strength coaches, yourself, myself, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, but we do do some travel, you know, that 20 minute drive into work, that 30 minute drive out of work, you know, speak your book, you know, pick a topic, pick a post-it note, talk about it, you know, as you're driving into work, record yourself and then get somebody to transcribe it, you know, and, and you'd be surprised how fast, you know, 60, 70,000 words adds up, you know, by yeah. speaking. And, and then it's just a matter of going through and editing and, and, and putting your ideas together. And so, um, I the, think- uh, the you're hired, I got someone to record me delivering a, a one day workshop for your hired. And then I gave that transcription to, um, professional transcriber, a copy editor that I found on a site called people per hour. I hired her. She did an intelligent transcription. She took out all of my errs and ums and swear words and <laughs> she made it sound right. And like you say, so I'd, I'd done a presentation that I was going to give anyway, and I paid her some money because it, and she turned it around within a day. That's this smart. was sort of eight hours worth of content. And she just intelligently transcribed it. I then had a bit of work to do around the sides, but yeah, it's, it's much more doable than people would, would imagine. I agree with you. No, that's, that's fantastic. Well, buddy, I know you're a busy guy, and we had some some stuff on the front end that kind of prevented us from getting started around on time. But uh, we end the show with some some resources here. Give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received. Okay. Well, now now I didn't receive this um, directly, but I read the book by John Wooden, and and one of the things that sticks with me is he talks about the glories in getting there. So I think a lot of young fitness professionals and, and strength coaches want to be there because of the badge or the team that they're working with and want to be there when they're picking up trophies. That's not that's not what we're there for. It, it, the glory is in getting there. It's knowing that maybe at high school you work with that kid and then you see them going on to win a major championship. You know that you had 1% or 2% influence on that. It's not always about being there with the championship ring uh, at the end of their career. I think that's that's something that I always say to any aspiring coach. Uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. You can't you know, beat John Wooden, can you? I mean, come on. <laughs> There's the, the guy's got eleven championship rings. You can you you might want to listen <laughs> to that guy. You know, one question I didn't ask before we finish with the the book app website recommendation is, you know, I, I've written a book that was on that topic. You know, as far as kind of getting hired, you wrote the book. You know, you're hired, obviously. Mm-hmm. You've read mine. What what is something that uh, that I didn't cover in mine that, that you covered in yours that is something missing from the young strength coach looking to get hired in the profession? Oh, wow. Now, there's a question. You, you, you blindsided me. There. Yeah, what, I, did, what I, I, you know, I apologize you? for that. But, that, um, I, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, mm. again, there's a lot of young coaches listening. I, I, what, or, 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 you know, what do you think is the best piece of advice you can give a young coach that's wanting to, to build this as a career? I think, I think, um, there's so many parallels between your book and mine. Um, so Agreed, yeah. the, the one thing that, that everyone said, well, two things. I'll go, I'll go to two things. One is never go to a gunfight uh, with a knife. Okay, so never take a knife to a gunfight. And what I mean by that is uh, every step of the way, you've got to be super prepared. Because just because you graduate with a three-year degree, you've got a knife. 
But you come up with people like me and you, and we're packing heat. We have got oozes and shotguns and all sorts. Right. So, you know, it, just because you've graduated, that that's level one. You've got to be doing everything you can at university to make yourself stand out. So never go to a, a, a gunfight with a, with a knife. Um, it is is absolutely key. And you know that that's. That's it for me, I think. You know, I've forgotten what the second one was I was going to say, Ron. If I remember, I'll tweet it. It was a good one as well. Yeah, yeah, please do. Well, go ahead. Then, you know, in that, in that light then, give us a, you know, for those, for those coaches that are listening, give us a book, app, and website recommendation. Okay, I think book-wise, it's the book that I tell everyone to get, and I must bore people about it, but How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Yep, it's a great one. Guy, guy wrote it in 1920 has nothing to do with strength and conditioning, but it has everything to do with strength and conditioning. Um, we're, in the, we're in the job of trying to get people to do things they probably don't really want to do. And, you know, that book has, has transformed the way I coach and the way I interact with um, colleagues. Brilliant book. Um, a website that I'm really enjoying looking at at the moment is Free Lap USA. Yeah, a good job. It's, it's, yeah, there's some great stuff coming out on there. It's it, I'm, I'm subscribed to that for, for most recently. It's, it's a great book. Um, and in terms of apps, um, let me think. I tell you, I, I've got. To, hopefully, I'm going to get the name right. I think it's just jump and just sprint. So basically, two apps that can um, measure. One, one will measure vertical jump height, and one will measure um, velocity, linear velocity. Huh. So. You know, two really good apps. I'm hoping that I've got the names right. We can probably check and if it's not, update the website. Uh, yeah, but again, sure. in this day and age, the, and they've been researched as well and, and they're, they're valid and reliable um, and very affordable. It's an app on your phone and all of a sudden you can measure jump height and linear velocity. Wow. I'll have to check that out. I, I'm not familiar with those. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just jump. And just sprint. I'll, I'll find out for definite. Oh, that's great. Well, Nick, man, I, I really appreciate you you taking some time and spending you know sp- spreading the word with everybody. And apologize for the the technical difficulties to, to everyone and yourself. And uh, but there's a ton of great stuff to even to pull out of this in a short amount of time. And what's the best way for people to stay up and uh, up with you and the things that you got going on? Um, well, I think probably two two ways. So I've got the website, which is uh, nickgrantham.com. And that's where I put my blog posts up and updates on, on speaking engagements. And then follow me on Twitter at Coach Rick G. Awesome. Well, buddy, I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. No, Ron, thank you very much. We got there in the end. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.